We're going to start our next session. Hope everyone is hanging in there. Having a good time? Yeah? Anyone? Are you having a good time so far? Yeah. <laughs> so, for our next session, I'm very excited to welcome Claire. Uh, Claire Chung. Um, Claire is the founder and managing director of Ignite Excel, which is a Silicon Valley based accelerator or seed fund focusing on early stage startups from Korea and Asia. Having worked with companies from abroad for over two decades, Claire understands the unique challenges entrepreneurs face as they bring new ideas, products, and services to the U.S. market. Claire serves as a chair of Asian Business League of San Francisco, currently serving as vice chair for SF Seoul Sister City Committee and a board member, uh, member at C uh, SCBCC. So she's going to tell you all about that really soon, so it's really my pleasure to introduce Claire. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good afternoon. How's, how's this? Can you hear me all the way in the back? No? Okay. Let's try. Should I turn it off? Can you hear me better in the back? Okay, great. All right. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much, Google, for hosting this event and inviting me to uh, speak uh, with you. Um, you know, you have a lot of uh, females in the room with the uh, bathroom stalls. All of them ran out of uh, uh, toilet papers. <laughs> uh, so it's wonderful to be here. What an honor to be uh, here. Um, let's see. So. Uh, when I was asked to speak uh, at this Female uh, Founder Summit, um, without a doubt, I just basically said, of course, yes. I said uh, yes in a heartbeat, uh, because it is definitely a topic that's dear to my heart. Um, but when I sat down to start thinking about, okay, so what am I going to talk about? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have a wild success story to share um, yet. Um, it's still in the process of making. Um, and I looked at the agenda and I noticed that we have a lot of experts, industry experts, specialists, talking about specific business angles. So I thought, you know, um, why don't I share uh, my experience and what I have learned and what I'm still learning um, as a female founder, um, as a mother, as a single mother, um, as a, um, a leader who's led uh, uh, women leadership programs to sort of share my experience uh, with you uh, from sort of the, the unique um, lens that I've experienced the world. Um, so with that, and the, the three pillars that's shaped my experience um, are obviously my, my personal journey um, as well as um, the nonprofit uh, Asian Business League of San Francisco, where I had co-developed uh, "You Are the CEO of You," which was really to, um, uh, which was really uh, empower the Asian American women uh, leaders. And then uh, the third pillar is my current uh, position as the managing director for uh, an accelerator and a seed fund that I run, Ignite Excel. So I'll go through each one as my background. And then I'll go through sort of the five um, lessons that I've learned, I'm still learning, okay? So, um, the, my unique lens to the world really starts out with me coming from Korea. We, uh, our family immigrated to the U.S. when I was 12 years old. Um, and unlike other, um, others who may have been scared of going to a completely new place, I was really excited. Um, I was excited to see the world. I've always been fascinated by different cultures, so it was an excitement to be coming to the U.S. Um, but growing up, I was quite a rebel. Um, I uh, was on my way to uh, UC Davis, but rather going to school, I decided I'm going to get married. 
<laughs> I thought I found the love of my life. And uh, um, I decided to get married, uh, gave up school, uh, and uh, um, had two lovely children. Uh, and then um, got divorced, became a single mom. Um, and then that's when I, my sort of career, I went back to school, and then that's when my career really started. Um, uh, start started. Um, the second pillar, um, being women, being Asian American uh, here, I was very passionate in terms of leadership um, in our community, and um, and so I had joined uh, a nonprofit called Asian Business League of San Francisco, which is actually right here in the city, um, uh, and as a um, chair. I had co-developed uh, this program called You Are the CEO of You, which is really a leadership program to uh, empower women in the mid-level management and how do we get you to sort of break that glass ceiling and get to the top management level. And so we had worked with um, over, I believe, over 60 different women um, uh, since its beginning, which we started, I believe, back in 2008 or so. Um, and I can tell you some of the examples from that uh, later. And then of course what I'm currently doing as Ignite Excel founder and uh, managing director is to work with entrepreneurs coming from Korea and Asia. And I do work with quite a bit of women entrepreneurs as well. Uh, and so my experience working with entrepreneurs from outside of the US as well as the women entrepreneurs and my experience with them, my learnings with them, I will share with you. So, what I have learned along the way. Um, be aware, uh, but don't accept. And I think it's really important for us to accept the fact that bias do exist. The sexism does exist. Um, as long as we're living in a society where um, uh, we know that sexism exists, we're gonna be experiencing it. And I think it's important for us to recognize it. Um, and, but recognizing doesn't mean that you um, stop. You, you basically figure out, okay, so how do I move beyond? And so for example, if you're playing a, uh, if, you've, if you take on a manager role, um, you think about what are the things that that as a manager, that you will want to be perceived as. Um, when we did the, the You Are the CEO of You program, we did basically an assessment, initial program. Uh, it was a, it was a, uh, a six week program. And we would start out with a self assessment. And one of the things we do talk about is what are the cultural values that brought up the way we think today. And oftentimes we would come across the fact that we, the, our cultural, Asian cultural values, um, really um, uh, brought us to think um, nurturing, we don't stand out, um, you know, we support, but we don't really take the lead. Um, so those rules, really, those values, uh, we, once we recognize it, how do we really turn them into something that we can uh, uh, play to advantage in our role? Um, one of our uh, speakers, Leslie Tang, who is now retired, uh, she talked about her experience um, when she became the Superior Court, court Judge, that she had a, and I think she still does, but when she started, she had a very high-pitched voice. Um, I can't, I can't mimic. But, um, so it was an issue, because as a judge, she needed to be taken seriously. But because of her, this high tone, voice, she realized, okay, I'm going to have to take a voice lesson to really work on, um, uh, to bring my voice tone down so that when she's with co her colleagues, as well as when she's, you know, presiding at the, the court, that she would be taken seriously. Um, and so she worked on that to really uh, uh, work on her voice and how she talked her tone um, uh, to, to make her, you know, um, to have that sort of the, the, the uh, to be taken more seriously. Um, 
another thing, um, another member of our um, program, also she was a uh, CFO and at a, at a community bank here in San Francisco. And she would be sitting in the, the, the board meeting. But again, she had this, and this is something that we again assessed during the assessment, we recognize that. She's, a, of course, she's an amazingly smart woman, but when she spoke, she would sort of bob her head. So, and, it's, and, and when you're so passionate, when you're talking about the issues, you, you, you don't realize how you look. And so this was one of the things that that we recognize early on and so hey, hey, you know, let's let's work on that. Let's work on when you are talking, when you are persuading, when you are uh, conveying a, a message. Let's make sure that you are, um, you know, you sit up and you speak with authority. Um, another example, um, and I think what really goes to show is that image does matter um, because the bias does exist. That if we don't, if we don't we do need to take the extra effort. That's really what I'm trying to say is that, you know what, regardless whether you like it or not, it does exist. And so if you want to be, if you want to claim that certain role, let's figure out what that role looks like and how you want to be perceived and really um, work um, uh, towards uh, playing that, claiming that role. And this is another thing that we did a lot with the program is bringing in a um, branding specialist, a personal branding specialist. And she even talked about how you dress, right? Um, and even though, yes, we want to be individualized, we want to, we want to show how we are, just natural self, yet, if you take on the, the leadership role, manager role, you really want to be taken seriously. And yes, regardless of whether you like it or not, people do judge you by how you dress. And so that was one of the things that we um, worked with each individual during the program as well. And another example, um, this was a, um, an executive who uh, was in the financial sector um, said that early on when he joined the company, um, he was actually, he, would, he, he didn't have to wear, it was a pretty casual, but he didn't have to wear a tie. You could just wear an open shirt and a shirt suit. But he would always wear a tie. And we're thinking, you know, why does that matter? But uh, for him, he wanted to appear to be a leader from the get-go. And he worked his way up, of course, he worked hard, but especially being Asian American, and uh, when you look at, let's say, the media, I know Asian ma American male for the longest time uh, was not looked upon as a, a leader leadership role. And so he really worked hard to um, convey the leadership image. And his sort of trick, or the, the way was to wear a tie every day to work. And he, you know, uh, is now the executive at one of the uh, largest banks. Um, leverage your advantage. Um, I sort of talked about taking the assessment and understanding what are the traits that you recognize as weaknesses and turning them to um, uh, your advantage. Um, I think we women um, are natural um, connectors. We are really good at relationship building. And I think that's something that we recognize early on, at least in our group, that you know that's a huge advantage in building your network. Um, so, um, Recognizing these traits and really working towards your advantage um, was something that we worked on a lot. Um, for me, personally, I remember uh, because I worked with entrepreneurs from Korea, or I would go to Korea to speak, and um, mostly I would be working, I would say 95% of the time, I'll be sitting in a room with older um, in, you know, uh, male, uh, in the room, and I would oftentimes be the only uh, female. And for those of you who don't know, we have a very different dialect when it's um, female tone versus the male tone when you're speaking in Korean. Um, and so I recognized early on that when I spoke Korean, my tone, my whole body language changed. I would become, I would have a higher pitch tone, and I would speak more softly because that's how 
who spoke, a uh, female spoke, um, and it actually was a disadvantage for me. So um, as soon as I recognized that, um, I uh, did something different. I basically would tell the men in the room, I would say, please feel free to speak Korean, but I actually uh, feel more comfortable speaking English. Um, I understand Korean, but um, I would like to speak English. And what that did, when I spoke English, um, my, again, my shoulder opened up, uh, my voice had more authority, and then not only that, the CEOs in the room, because you spoke English, the respect just went up, right? Uh, so it sort of really play, uh, uh, made the, the playing field even. Uh, and that was just one of the tricks I learned early on that when I'm dealing with, especially in Asia where it's very hierarchical culture, uh, and you're a female, um, you're really having to sort of, you know, uh, fight this upstream to really um, position yourself equally when you're dealing with the CEOs. Uh, so that was a, another, you know, example of really figuring that out early on and really changing that dynamics. Another thing, um, I remember um, a good friend of mine who's, uh, who's a partner at a law firm always would tell me that whenever she gets, uh, she's hiring associates, she sees a difference between um, the male attorney associates and female attorney associates and female attorney associates, their ask um, for the salary is always lower. And she just could not figure, and even during the negotiation, female attorneys would never ask for more. And, and this was something that she would always go uh, talk about when she's speaking to female, any kind of gathering, right? For me, Maybe it's just because we feel like we don't want to be perceived as a greed, you know, as greedy or whatever it is. I know, I, I know exactly what that's like, right? Um, but early on, when I had to negotiate my salary with my employer, my best friend basically told me, and I was a single mom. Remember, my career started after I got divorced. Um, she's like, go in there and think of your kids, think of your babies. You are going to negotiate on your be on behalf of your babies, and you know what? As soon as she said that, my whole attitude changed. It was no longer about me asking more money, but you know what? I need this. I deserve this. And ever since then, whenever I'm negotiating, of course my kids are now grown up, uh, but back then, um, I definitely that really gave me the strength and just gave me a whole different attitude. So again, look at, you know, look at what, you, what you have, your surroundings, and how can you turn that into your advantage um, is something that I'd like to um, uh, emphasize. I think, and this is something that I'm still struggling. This is, this is a constant um, work in progress where the biggest barrier that we put on ourselves is the self-doubt. Um, I was crazy busy this week uh, because we have our cohort, um, our, uh, we have 10 entrepreneurs from Korea, and uh, um, they, we had our demo day last week. We're also presenting at Levi Stadium uh, today. They, they presented today, this morning. So I was really busy basically helping them prepare and I'm like, oh my God, I have to go to Google Launchpad and I have to present as well. And I basically just barely got through just organizing my thoughts for this talk. And of course, all along I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, am I really qualified to speak in front of all these wonderful women, right? You're always having this self-doubt. Um, and I think for me, before I stand uh, in front of all of you, really, again, not because I have some amazing success story to share, but because I'm older, hopefully I'm wiser, and that uh, experiences that I've uh, led uh, in my journey, which is, I believe, somewhat unique, uh, but hopefully it'll speak to some of you. Uh, and so I really have to kind of talk myself into this, right? And this happens all the time. I don't know about you, but even with my cohort, whenever I get the new cohort, I've got pretty much, I would say, 80% of them are male, 
and sometimes they're older than me, right? Most of the time. And so you really have to work yourself up to really have that authority. At the same time, you are there to really support them. But it's really important when you're leading a group, you establish that, that leadership and the authority. And it's something that, again, I, um, I am constantly working on uh, to overcome. And I realize this is something that I think I know when I talk to my girlfriends, this is something that we're always guilty of. Um, and so how do we overcome that? And I think um, you know, one of the ways is that you're just going to have to challenge yourself all the time so that once you do it, then you'll gain the confidence. It's like public speaking, right? I think that's a classic example. Um, I used to hate public speaking. I even took Toastmaster classes because I hated it so much. But then I knew I had to overcome it. And so I would go to these Toastmaster classes early morning and just really, you know, force myself to get in front of people and speak. Um, now, um, you know, it, it doesn't bother me at all. It's just a matter of can I really um, uh, make the time valuable to the audience is really my question. But again, in terms of the public speaking, no longer um, is a scary thought for me. And so again, really constantly challenging. Um, I was also asked to serve on a board. It's a, it's a country club. And I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm so busy with my work. Why would I want to serve on a, a, a board? Um, and it was, I was asked because I was the only female. It was a predominant. It was it's a 12-member team board member, and they're all male. And I think, let's see, when I joined, it was all white male except one. There was one Asian um, American male. So I would be stepping into a board um, where I would not only be the only female, but I would be the the the, the Asian American female. Right, and um, I had to really think about this because, again, not only you know the schedule conflict, all that, but why would I want to do this? And yes, of course, because I do care about the the club, you know, and and the people that I I, um, I would serve. But I took that on as a challenge because because I was so engrossed in the Asian American community that I've actually never stepped out of that Asian American community that I've actually not really been involved in a, uh, an actual, you know, a, in a board where it was predominantly Caucasian, let alone be male. So it was a challenge for me. And uh, I decided, okay, um, this is a great learning experience. This is going to be a great learning experience. Um, so I ended up uh, taking on the board seat and I still currently serve as a board. And I'll share some of the experiences with you as well. But again, uh, when you have these opportunities where you sort of question, well, you know, uh, do I deserve it or can I? Um, I encourage you to take that uh, step forward and take that challenge because you learn so much if you hadn't otherwise. Um, so it's constantly really challenging yourself to take on these roles that you may have passed on, but it really helps you to grow. Uh, as a person, as a leader. Um, absolutely look for role models, um, mentors, support group, even your girlfriends. Whenever you have these self-doubts, I think it's really important for you to um, have someone that you can speak to and be able to really talk it over and for that person or the group to really help you um, get yourself out of that self-doubt mode. Um, because. Again, like I said, I do it all the time. And so, whether it be my husband, or now I'm married, by the way, so <laughs> uh, whether it be my husband, or my girlfriends, or my mentors, that I would have to, you know, if I can, whenever I um, have these outs, I'll talk it over with them. And they're the ones like, you know, um, you can do this. And you just sometimes just need to hear that from someone, to say that you can do this, right? That's all you need sometimes. Um, so absolutely having that support group, um, mentors, the role models um, is something that I strongly, strongly encourage everyone to um, seek out. Number four. Um, this is something that, again, this is a constant work in progress. 
Um, I think, I don't know, again, this is, I'm speaking from my experience, right? And I'm, I'm very passionate, but I also, because I'm so passionate in everything that I do, I get very emotional. And so even in meetings, even at board meetings, you know, when something really doesn't go right, I would become very emotional. And, and the way I would communicate, sometimes it will come out with emotions. And I realized that is not the way to influence. When you're in a you know, room full of males, especially, um, they just look at you like, oh my God, here she goes again, right? Um, so these are things that I, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning that when I know I have to go to a board meeting and I have to present something that I really care about, I really prepare. I even make my husband listen to me <laughs> and just give me, you know, critique how I'm presenting it and am I presenting it without emotion but really kind of factual and persuas persuas uh, persuasive. Um, and because I, and I'm, I'm just gonna say, I, for me, you know, um, I think it's just my, me being female that just I become very emotional and I get sometimes really bogged down on details. So I'm always constantly asking myself to sort of step back and ask myself, why am I here? Why am I doing this? And what's my objective? What's the outcome that I want to drive uh, towards? And sort of that really helps me to think and, and sort of go beyond that emotional state and be able to really speak persuasively uh, to get the point across. And, and I still make so many mistakes um, on this part, and that's why I wanted to share this with you because I do it all the time still, and uh, I, it's, I'm still working on it. Um, but by sharing with you that you'll also recognize if you do this, for you to really step back and constantly remind yourself, and even practice it with others. If you have an important, um, presentation or if you have an important a meeting where you really need to persuade the group, um, practice it, prepare it. And, 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 and there are a lot of books and resources around how to talk, how to be persuasive. I think these are things that, we, you know, especially the, the, the topics, the issues that you care about, um, is where you really want to remove yourself uh, from being emotional and be able to really um, uh, be more professional, I guess, uh, be more factual, and be more persuasive. Um, and lastly, um, I'm sure you've all heard this, but dots do connect, and I can't uh, speak enough about the random connections that I've made, even the works that I've done along the way or the connections that I've made throughout my um, uh, career. Um, it's amazing how they come to connect with one another. Um, one example, just a random example, where uh, we were at a conference, and this was a large um, app, app conference in Santa Clara Convention Center, and because my team was working the booth, I had to take uh, lunch for them, and typically they only have like sandwich and burgers, right? And so uh, I decided to take sushi bento for my team. Had eaten, and then I, um, after my team had eaten, I came down and uh, um, was just eating sushi bento, and before you know it, every person passing by would stop and say, where did you get that, right? Because they're like, okay, they certainly did not have that at the, wherever they were at the lunch uh, cafeteria. And so literally, we, would, we could not, my, my team member, and we could not eat because we would just, as soon as we pick up something, someone would come over and says, you know, ask us, where did you get, where did you get the bento? So there were two guys sitting next to us, um, Isaac and Zoe. They would, they would basically laugh, and every time someone came over, they would say, hi, my name is Zoe, what do you do? They were basically networking. <laughs> While we were being asked where we got the bento, every time someone came over, and it was literally every second, they would actually take that opportunity to network. And so it was so funny that, you know, when we got the chance, I'm like, okay, so what do you do? And it turned out that they were from Santa, um, uh, Santa Monica, Southern Cal, 
and they were here to see um, meet with John from Hyundai Ventures, which happens to be a good friend of mine. So I said, and they already knew his schedule. Like he was speaking at some gig the next day, so they were gonna go crash there to meet with them. I'm like, oh, that's really funny. He's a good friend. So I made him take a picture, and I sent it over to, I texted over to John. I said, hey, John, there are two guys here who would really love to meet you. And then, guess what? John happened to be at the conference. So he ended up coming over, saying hello to these two uh, guys. And then they ended up actually uh, arranging a meeting. And then three months later, Zoe and um, Isaac emails me, thank you so much. We struck up a partnership with Hyundai. And so now they got the Hyundai cars. Where they, they, it's a wave car, and they do a, um, advertising on all the cars. Uh, and so they were able to strike up a partnership. Just a random chance. But again, by connecting, uh, and this is something that I share with all of our entrepreneurs, you never know. You never know how dots are gonna connect. Whenever you go, be nice, be respectful, be helpful, uh, be supportive, because you never know when that's gonna come back around and, and, and help you in a critical time. Um, even just yesterday, we were at a, com we were at a conference at Levi Stadium. Um, just randomly, as I was walking, walking out, this um, gentleman comes over and says, hello, Claire, and I'm like, Oh, should I, I know him, but I couldn't remember his name. <laughs> two years ago, that was last, uh, two years ago that I had met with him. It turns out that he was working for Airbus Innovation and Accelerator. And one of my uh, companies in my cohort right now um, was already working with Airbus in France, but then he wasn't really moving forward. And so he really needed to kind of, you know, uh, figure out how to move forward with the next step. Guess what? I'm like, Dr. Hugh, come over here. Me, Taylor. <laughs> so they're actually having a meeting downstairs <laughs> today. So these kind of random connections are always happening all around me. And so I can't tell you enough how important it is to um, connect. And I think the rule of thumb is be helpful. Whenever you have the opportunity to help others, be helpful. Because when you need that help, you never know who you're going to have to ask. And if you were helpful, they'll remember. And they'll be the first one to step up and try to help you, right? And when it comes to, again, female founders, female colleagues, you know, if we can support one another, um, uh, if we have that huge network that we talked, you know, that would really um, help us to get to the next level, I think that's where we can really rise above and, and be able to really take the, the more leadership that we can take, um, the more help that we can give to one another. We, I know we're gonna talk about investments, how do we, um, you know, if we can get more investors, if we can get more women in the partnership level at the, the VC firms, you know, that they're gonna be, that we can go and seek uh, investments. That's where we're gonna have to really help one another to help them get there as well. So with that, um, I will, conclude my talk and maybe take a few questions. Okay. Female venture capitalists. Um, so I guess number one, we got it, we have to have more females in coming from the financial sector. Or so because when you look at venture capitalists, where do they come from? They either come from the investment banking, right? Um, they have that financial background, or they themselves have been an entrepreneur most of the time they, you know, successful entrepreneur. So um, if we can support more female founders to be successful, where they have an awesome successful exit, then hopefully they'll then turn that into a, and I, I believe there are already quite a few, um, uh, into a fund where they can then support uh, female entrepreneurs. Does that answer your question? Okay. Hi, yeah. Wanda. Thank you so much for your talk. I, I really related to how you would go back and forth between the U.S. and Asia. I go back and forth between here and Myanmar, um, where you know my family has a business, and I, I would love to hear you talk more about um, you know that experience going back and forth between those cultures because I would love to build the ecosystem there. 
and you know, like serve uh, as a way to build that community. Sure, sure. I go back to Korea every other month, so I go back quite often. And um, uh, whenever I go, I um, host this Ignite Excel social, um, so that we're inviting our past, you know, the graduates of our programs, as well as any entrepreneurs who are interested in, let's say, some of the global markets. Um, we do get quite a bit of female uh, founders to come, and one of the things that I do is I really try to encourage them. I try to really encourage them that they too can think about global business. Oftentimes, especially female entrepreneurs, they tend to um, work on, uh, a lot of times they're like non-tech, uh, and then they'll just really look at domestic markets, because I think also they don't have enough role models that have successful um, uh, global business that they built, that they just don't think of themselves as um, doing something, anything you know, you know, too global. Um, and so that's one of the things that I do is to try to talk to as many female entrepreneurs when they come to these kind of networking events. Um, what else do I do? Um, whenever I go to these, um, so I go to also remote areas too, not just Seoul, which is you know pretty metropolitan, but I go to all these like remote areas, regions, um, and I try to have office hours so that anyone who is remotely interested in um, global business to come and talk to me. Because when we put out um, uh, an application for our programs, um, the number of applicants that we get is, I would say, let's say, if they're like not even 5%. And the reason is because most of the time they don't feel confident enough. They don't feel that, oh, how can I possibly how can I possibly go to the U.S. market, right? It's this lack of self-confidence. So that's something that I'm trying to um, really help them overcome. Not that everybody should be coming, but at least I want them to start thinking about can I possibly build a business um, that's for the global markets. Um, and so I try to do a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I try to um, do a lot of speaking at universities as well. Um, I love talking to university students because they're just so open-minded. You know, they're so energetic. So um, try to just get the word out, try to encourage them, try to um, sort of give them a, a little exposure of what Silicon Valley is like, uh, what what it means to really you know, uh, be a global entrepreneur. Does that help? Okay. So you're gonna be around for a minute or two after yes. the talk? Um, or, yes. I'll be here about 15 more minutes or so. And then I'll okay. Off, I hope that was helpful. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take a short break, and we're going to be here at 3.30 to learn how to build a culture in your company. So, hiring team, building culture, and see you soon.